everyone, and welcome to Heartbeat Alaska, Native news and Native information. Hello, Canadians. Nice to have you with us. If you're ever in Anchorage, Alaska, stop by our studios. Give us a call, 907-563-7440, and I'd love to meet you. Hello to all our good friends across America. Hello to our good friends across Montana. Get those Christmas greetings out wherever you are. And make sure you get them into me for our annual Heartbeat Alaska Christmas special. Today's program, we travel north to Unalakleet, which we know as Unalakleet. It's a beautiful village with ancient history. We also travel to the Pribilof Islands to St. George. Unalakleet means the southern end. It's a designation, clear direction, directions that our ancient ancestors used to go for commerce and trade, to socialize. Go with me now to Unalakleet, the southern end. A lot of people think that Unalakleet means where the east wind blows, but the word Unalakleet is actually an Inupiaq word uh, pronounced Ungalakleet, and Ungalakleet means uh, from the southern end. Uh, Unalakleet is the southernmost Inupiaq uh, community in western Alaska. Tim Tawarik grew up here in this ancient trading place. From Unalakleet southward, it turns into Yupik country. The next community down is St. Michael, and from St. Michael all down, it's, it's all Yupik country. We have a lot of Yupiks that live in Unalakleet, uh, but uh, Unalakleet was originally an Inupiaq town. I mean, uh, Ungalakleet, the people from the southern end. Historically, this used to be a, um, a trading center where the, um, the Athabascan Indians would come in from the interior and the people from up north or you know anywhere up and down the coast would come to Unalakleet and trade with the Indians. And, and any other place, there were wars that went on between the Inupiaq and the Indians and a, a lot of uh, my native uh, compatriots in the interior uh, have heard stories of those. So it's not anything unknown. But uh, in Unalakleet, it was a place where there were no wars between the Indians and the Inupiaq. It was a place, a commerce place. And, People had uh, mutual respect for each other. The Unalakleet River goes 90 miles inland toward Caltag, and between here and there, there are a number of um, anthropological uh, digs finding, you know, evidence of uh, both Indian and Inupiaq uh, utensils and uh, things, you know, that were left in, in those camps. Researchers have also found house remains near Unalakleet's beaches dating back as far as 200 BC. To put that in perspective, we're talking about Inupiaq walking these beaches as the Roman Empire was just getting started on the other side of the world. If you walk up one of the hills near Unalakleet, it's easy to see why people settled here so long ago. Stanton and Irene Patchtag, two yes, respected no, elders, no, explain. Uh, uh, getting food easier is they chose the place where there is more resources like fish, any kind of other game, and seal for our, uh, our uh, ocean hunting. And of course, good water. 
Unilaclitis, we have good water. The old ways of subsistence continue in Unilaclete, despite the huge changes of the last 100 years. <laughs> The people of Unilaclete have watched things come and go like Covenant High. Started in 1954, the school brought in students from all over western Alaska, but since the 70s, it has only been a school of ghosts. There are two roads out of Unilaclete. One leads to Army Hill and the other to Air Force Hill. Both the Army and Air Force had bases here. Now the only reminders of the military are these. Well, the burials were brought here back in the 50s when uh, the Air Force came in. They were putting an ACNW site and uh, they didn't have any storage, so they brought a year's supply of fuel, or at least a year's supply of fuel to uh, build a road and build a site so they they brought in hundreds of uh, thousands of barrels of fuel into Unilaclete and once they were empty they stored them in a low level area and in one of the high tides that we had uh, a high storm came in and took them and scattered them all over the country here so and the IRA council has been working for years trying to get the, the federal government the Department of Defense to come in and clean up the site and the barrels and uh, that's this is the result of it. Tim Tawarik is the president and CEO of the Bering Straits Corporation. A branch of that corporation is doing the cleanup. <laughs> Donald Warwick is part of the crew working on the barrel project. We're over 2,000 now, 2,000 barrels. A little more than halfway done. They expect us to get like 3,300 barrels, so I don't know. Or that's what we're getting paid for, so that's where we're going to stop, I guess. Until next summer. <clears throat> These barrels were scattered all over, and uh, you know, every 10 feet or so you'd see them, and they're just sitting there rotting all these, you know, 40 or 50 years. And it was a very unpleasant sight. Anywhere you went, you'd see these barrels, and to us, it almost became natural. You know, I think uh, there are many, many people that are born uh, since those barrels have been there, and they uh, come to think it's part of the country. Well, it's it's really improved the um, country here. We, we used to see these barrels scattered everywhere we go, but uh, it's it's doing wonders I think for the environment you know just making it look a lot more natural without any barrels sticking up all over the flats here. Cleaning up the barrels isn't the only way Unilaclete is healing the wounds of the past 100 years. the language and culture is important because the, the students starting off young they need to learn about their culture and they need to be proud of who they are and the, the values that we have had I mean our ancestors have had it needs to be carried on you know otherwise our community won't be it, it would be unsafe or we would um, fear um, you know like Respect is a part of the culture, and we learn to respect our land and our people and ourselves, and that's important for our students to learn. This may look and sound like a typical fifth grade classroom, but these students in culture class at the Unilaclete School are learning values and traditions that many think are the building blocks to a much brighter future for our native villages here and throughout Alaska. 
I feel uh, when they first when I first got started here four years ago, and I was very proud it's still going on because the values are so important for them to learn when they're young, and they'll keep it on as they grow older. Their language, Inubak, was forbidden by the missionaries many years ago. And but for a few who held on to the old ways, was nearly forgotten and lost forever. The language is Inupak, but it's a, the dialect for Quirk. I mean, the dialect Quirk. There's um, two different dialects in Inupi, but we're teaching Quirk. And the reason we're teaching Quirk is because it, it was dying more than Malamute was. I mean, it, was being, it wasn't being spoken as much as Malamute, the dialect. Singing, dancing, beating, carving, and sewing may look like child's play, but there is a growing awareness in Alaska that by learning the ways of the past, today's young people will have a better understanding of themselves and what their role is in the future of their village. Maybe about eight years, I think, that they started the Kumo dancing here again. And the reason is so that the students could feel proud of their culture, you know, they could be active in what what the culture is about, and if we're dancing is a part of the culture, and it's it's mostly just songs. I mean, they're mostly stories or um, dances about what someone has done in their life. You know, it's a story. It's not um, evil or anything. Flanked by the icy waters of the Bering Sea and a checkpoint for the last great race, the village of Unalakleet struggles to prepare for an uncertain future. Like many Alaskans, they are discovering that the traditions of the past, the language of their people, the wisdom of the elders, now more than ever play a key role in their survival and the survival of all rural Alaska. I think it's really important that each community continues to teach their language and culture and teach their traditional values because it does affect their students and the future generations. What's the whistle for? Go to the temple. Go to the temple. So if you guys hear me blow it, you need to go there. It's a seventh grade science class and we're on a field trip to obtain uh, samples of plants particularly and we're going to go back to the classroom and they're going to identify the plant based on what, what they have. It's going to have a scientific name and they're going to identify each one for their uh, Eskimo name, the nutritional value if there's some, if it's edible, and um, if they're not edible, for example, some of them may have picked up a part of a, a willow, which is utilized for, um, to dye skin, like on mukluks. <laughs> A mushroom, some kind of lichen, I think, that was on a log, and a green kind of leaf plant that was growing um, by some alders. And then eventually we're going to come up with um, uh, sharing this information with the Russian kids over in, over in Russia. And the Russian students are going to share similar kinds of things over here. So we're, since we're kind of in the same zone or climate zone, uh, we're hoping to have if there's similarities, if they notice if there's changes over a period of time. And uh, so those, that's kind of what the long-term project would, would look like. And um, eventually we're going to get maybe five of our, of our students to go to Anchorage and then some of the students from Russia are going to come over and we're just going to, um, we're going to have an interpreter and the kids are going to be able to trans translate what they've learned and, and um, share similarities if there's any. Today we've been learning how to preserve plants for later observation. What kind of plant is this one? What kind of plant is this one, guys? Some kind of berry. 
actually some kind of berry. It looks like a wine berry. It's the lime. What? It looks like wine. to that that uh, students will relate with the elders they need to go back and say this is what kind of name we used many many years ago or even today and so that they could at least communicate with the elders for um, for that particular plant or plants that they're working with. Friday afternoon. Now Henry Ivanoff Sr. Weekend, is at the controls at Unilakut's uh, radio station, West, uh, KNSA. Like and the view from this radio station isn't half bad. It's a view Henry's been looking for his whole life. That was my goal uh, to move back home. Uh, I moved back here in 1978 and 82, started building the radio station, and we, we went on there at 85. wanted to request going out to Sonia Simpson uh, in Ilham. And it's by NMM with uh, Clean My Closet and uh, Robert Simpson said to Sonia, say, I love you. Unless you're an I Did a Ride Musher, this is probably how you'll first see Unilicleet. I'm pilot here at Tagline Aviation Unit. This is something I want to do since I was a kid. Went to flight school in Anchorage. Got all my licenses. Came over to Unit. Unlike many pilots in rural Alaska, Tim Sagunik doesn't view his job as a stepping stone to a bigger airline. He's here to stay. And uh, I know all the people in the area, and I enjoy flying here. Don't just go after your dreams. And do your best. You can make things happen. One of the other ways to get around this part of Alaska is by skiff. This is John Wilson. He's the chief of police in Unilakley. He's just about to go upriver with his family. As chief of police, John gets to see the worst side of Unilakley firsthand. It's, it's got its times, you know. There's a lot of alcohol-related calls, most of them. Over 90% of our, our calls are alcohol-related, which is sad for, for them. Despite all that, this is still where John wants to raise his family. I sure do. My, I have three kids, and my wife's from Norvik, and she moved down here with me, and we've been living here. I've been living here 28 years, and I, I just love it here. It's a great place. Kids grew up in a good, good environment. No, I wouldn't say no alcohol, but you know, less than the, the big cities. But it's a good place to live for, for a family. Well, where are you guys gonna camp at? What all these people have in common? is that they left Unilicate for a while. They were drawn back here, some by family. Some by dreams. Some by the children. Some to solve problems. All of them came back here because there is no place they'd rather be.
It's an island of rugged beauty, an island of mist, a home to countless birds from all over the world. Hundreds of miles out in the Bering Sea, St. George Island is one of the most remote places on the planet. But for about 150 people, it is the only place they'll call home. Healthcare in such a remote place is not easy. What would be a minor problem in a big city can become an emergency out here. Well, um, right here is one of our exam rooms, exam room one. Georgia Cachavera works hard to keep the small clinic on St. George up to date and staffed. But it's not easy to recruit qualified people from so far away. We have been seeking the past two years for a full-time PA physician assistant and, um, and we're still trying to secure, if not a physician assistant, a nurse practitioner, or RN, registered nurse, uh, to cover our clinic, and it's been pretty hard. St. George is an old village full of quaint old buildings, but there's nothing quaint about outdated and run-down medical equipment. As you see, this is an old x-ray machine, and it has a ten tendency to short out. The St. George Traditional Council raised $470,000 for new equipment in their clinic, but they needed a little more. With such a clear need, public support in the community and a traditional council ready to support the clinic, the Denali Commission saw a great opportunity to help. Through a program called Fast Track, the commission was able to get $57,000 to the clinic in a very short time. We're getting a new um, oxygen filtration system because we have to send out our oxygen bottles and that costs a lot of money. Fast Track allows projects with a good plan and strong community involvement get their funding in a matter of months rather than years. We'll be also getting a new uh, stretcher with an IV pole attached to it. It was a little help at just the right time for an island that is working hard to make their corner of the world a little brighter. The Denali Commission, Alaskans working together to build a better Alaska. Thank you for watching Harpy Alaska. Thank you, Ferno, Tweedo, and Stephanie Keller, and everyone else in Unilaclete for your help in this story. We had wonderful hospitality when we were there, and we're very, very thankful to you. And thankful to you, too, for joining us for another Harpy Alaska. And if you like the St. George segment, look for Heartbeat in the future. We have a whole program on St. George. Until next week, I'm Jeannie Green. For all of us here, God bless you, and we'll see you next week.